the, uh, this unit was a National Guard unit uh, which uh, was located throughout the northern uh, part of Connecticut. But my uh, uh, unit was located in uh, Hartford at the State Armory in, uh, on Broad Street in Hartford, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had previously served for uh, 15 months in the, uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps where I learned a lot of things about the Army because it was run uh, by two regular Army officers in each camp. And, uh, but uh, we had no weapons. We used uh, shovels, axes, saws, and so forth to work in the woods, uh, in the, mostly in the state forest uh, uh, here in Connecticut. Uh, Patchogue State Forest, in fact, is where I was. And uh, they ran the company almost exactly as I did when I had a company later in, on active service. And uh, the CC camps gave me a lot of information as to how the different branches of, the, of a company worked. And I found that to be a big advantage to me when I finally got on to, into the U.S. Army. And uh, I did, uh, I, I, I served in their CC camps for 15 months and started as a basic, worked in the woods for about seven months, and uh, then I, uh, became the company clerk because I had an ability to type. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was my only qualification. And uh, then I became the supply sergeant and uh, 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 three, four months before I uh, got out of the camp, I was this, uh, what they call the senior leader or first sergeant of the company. I was only 20, uh, well, I was almost 21 when I got the job of act, the first sergeant. Uh, when I, enli I enlisted in the Connecticut Army National Guard and then uh, spent uh, my basic there and uh, I, I was uh, called up uh, to active duty. The, the whole uh, regiment, and which was part of the 43rd Infantry Division, was called up for active duty on 24 February 1941. And, uh, I uh, was assigned uh, with the division to Camp Landing, Florida, where, we, where I served uh, at first as a private and then made uh, a PFC with a specialist rating of third class and, and then uh, advanced to sergeant. And I, I ended up uh, as a master sergeant. I spent three years as an enlisted man and my highest rank was Master Sergeant. And uh, we moved from Camp Landing to go to the Louisiana Maneuvers, which lasted for three months and a half, I think it was. And we traveled all over uh, the area around the state of Louisiana, part of Texas, and, and uh, uh, maneuvering with the U.S. Army uh, troops. And uh, then we came, uh, we, uh, came uh, to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. And, uh, and by the way, while I was at Camp Blanding in, uh, it would be 66 years ago, I, I married my wife. And so we traveled around the, in the States before I went overseas. And uh, the uh, transfer to to uh, the whole division to Camp Shelby lasted about almost a year. And uh, we did various training. Uh, uh, I, uh, I had applied uh, to be a, a warrant officer and I was uh, appointed uh, uh, warrant officer junior grade at Camp Shelby. And uh, uh, then I, uh, I went to uh, Fort Ord, California, and my wife went back to New Britain where, where her family lived. And I shipped overseas out of San Francisco from Fort Ord. And that was on, uh, it was shipped out on the 1st of October, uh, 1942. And uh, we, we, uh, we got onto, in Frisco, we loaded onto a Dutch, uh, uh, 
liner that was converted to troop uh, carrying. And um, we, had, we had, were 22 days at sea and landed in Auckland, New Zealand, where uh, we had all, we had to uh, unload all the equipment off the ship. And everything in Frisco was loaded like a commercial basis. When we got to New Zealand, the, the trucks and the artillery and, the, and the, all the vehicles uh, were in crates. So the, uh, the entire division maintenance people were all put in one camp and they put all these vehicles back together again. And, and when we left, uh, we only stayed in New Zealand for about one month. And uh, my unit was located in a small town called Walkworth which was north of Auckland, uh, New Zealand. We uh, loaded uh, uh, in a combat fashion on uh, ships in uh, Auckland Harbor and went to New Caledonia, where we made a, a landing off the side of the ship. And uh, I'd just like to mention that uh, in my 37 months overseas, the only time I ever got on a ship through to a gangplank was when I got on in Frisco and off in uh, New Zealand. And after that, every time we went to an island, we went over the side of the ship, down the nets, and into the small boats. And that was quite interesting when you, with the low, the small boat going up and down, and the big ship moving slightly too. So as you went down the side of the nets, you had to be very careful because we were full with the uh, full equipment on us, the rifles, ammo, everything pack and down the side we went. But uh, we stayed in uh, New Caledonia, which was a French uh, island, for about uh, just about two months. And then we loaded uh, in uh, Numea Harbor, which is the capital of New Caledonia, and we went to Guadalcanal. And uh, we landed in Guadalcanal around the 1st of January, 43. And we got into the tail end of the fighting in Guadalcanal, but most of our time there was spent on patrolling. And uh, in fact, most of the Japs we saw were dead ones killed by the units ahead of us. And uh, we only stayed in Guadalcanal for a little bit less than a month. And uh, then we reloaded onto ships and we moved up to uh, some islands called the Russells. And our there were, there were several, there were two medium-sized islands and a few smaller ones. And uh, we were there for about four months. And then we loaded again uh, and uh, made the invasion in the, in the northern Solomons on the island of New Georgia. And, and New Georgia was our first real combat uh, situation and it was one tough situation. Most people who haven't been out in the islands, they have no idea, they think they're tropical paradises. Yeah. And it's absolutely not like that because of the heat, rained all the time, we were always wet, we had to live in foxholes, uh, so people were shooting at us. And while I was in, uh, in uh, we moved from uh, the island of Rendova, where we first landed. We moved over to New Georgia, where the fighting was. We, uh, we had a, uh, a mission to take uh, through the jungle, about six miles, to fight through there, to take the Munda airfield. And that, was, that Munda airfield was started by the Japs. And uh, they did have a few airplanes there, but uh, when we captured it, it took us uh, a little less than a month to capture the airfield. And uh, we had, uh, lo that whole month was tough, tough fighting. I know I, I uh, was on a patrol once, and by the way, I was strictly an infantry man. And uh, the, uh, I, I was with the, uh, a patrol of seven people, including me and my one of my sergeants, and uh, we we got caught in an ambush. And uh, of the seven, 
Four were killed immediately by machine gun fire, and uh, my captain was was badly wounded, and uh, myself and my sergeant were the only ones that weren't hit. But uh, he and I rescued our captain and gave him first aid, and he was badly hit. But we got him to the to the regimental medics, and uh, but he only survived for uh, uh, two nights, and then. Uh, the, the Japs uh, ran through the uh, medical aid center and they killed about 35 patients and some other soldiers. And uh, he, this captain of mine got killed. I, he was uh, badly wounded, he couldn't do anything, and he, it ended up he was bad at it. And uh, that, uh, that fighting went on on other smaller islands after we took Budda. And uh, we were we were troubled with air Jap uh, bombing on the airfield and upward our, our areas. The uh, the weather w was always bad. It always rained at night or even during the daytime. The heat was oppressive. Uh, we'd be moving through swamps, and next thing you know, you had leeches all over you. And those are horrible things. They, the the way we treated them was, if a guy, I, by the way, never smoked, but uh, I'd have always had friends that did. We, when you got a leech on you somewhere, they'd put their cigarette butt against the back end of the leech and he'd pull out. Otherwise, the head would come off and you'd get an infection if you just tried to pull them off. Uh, there was, uh, we had many, many casualties on New Georgia. And uh, the uh, the Japs were were very hard fighters. They uh, we had to admire them as to the way they fought to the death. And you uh, you assaulted an area, and uh, they wouldn't give up unless they were dead or so badly wounded they couldn't move or something. Some of them would commit Harry Carey. That they what they called Harry Carey was putting her grenade. A Jap grenade, by the way, they had to tap it on their helmet to ignite it, and then they would put it against their chest and kill themselves. That, I saw that happen many times. And uh, we, uh, we were on New Zealand until early 19, I mean on uh, New Georgia till early 1944, and then we had been in the island for about 19 months. We we were, uh, the whole division moved down to New Zealand. And uh, we, we, uh, we landed in New Zealand. Uh, it, it was about a 10 day, 12 day trip from New Georgia down to, uh, to the uh, New Zealand. And my battalion, which was the third battalion of 169 Infantry, uh, we didn't move with the division. They shipped us up to an island called Vela La Vela, uh, which we stayed there, and we stayed there for about a month. And then we went, we were the last unit to get back to New Zealand. But uh, when we got to New Zealand, we had uh, two weeks of uh, vacation time, and half the command could leave. When they came back, the other half would go. And then we started intensive training, long marches. But the island, uh, New Zealand, was absolutely beautiful country. Beautiful weather, uh, rained occasionally too. And uh, we went on maneuvers in an area of Rotorua, which was uh, uh, run by the Maoris, uh, who were the native people of New Zealand. And uh, they were a very, very nice uh, people they, uh, they they were treated uh, very very well by the uh, the English branch of the population uh, there in New Zealand. From uh, New Zealand, uh, we cranked up to go to New Guinea, and if if uh, New Georgia was bad, uh, we landed at uh, a place uh, called uh, Atawan. And uh, they, uh, we, we, where we landed was in a big coconut grove. And uh, our mission was we relieved the 32nd Division, and uh, our troops moved up onto the 
to the river line, which blocked the Japs from moving back and forth along the coast. And uh, we were on what they called the Drenamore River. And the Japs kept fighting to get across that, and we kept killing them by the hundreds. And uh, finally that place, that quieted down. And uh, we were there for about six months in New Guinea. And uh, the, the terrain there was worse than uh, New Georgia. It had uh, very high mountains. We were in along the coastline, and then there were the foothills, and then the high mountains. And uh, I remember one time. Uh, uh, and by the way, in New Georgia, I had uh, I received a battlefield commission from warrant officer, chief warrant officer, to uh, uh, second lieutenant, and it was offered to me three months before I took it, and I wouldn't take it because uh, first off I had questions about being a second lieutenant infantry. Right. Second, as a chief warrant officer, I made about $70 more a month. And in, in back then, $70 was a lot of money. But I finally, uh, they kept after me, and I finally got uh, commissioned to second lieutenant infantry, and I was assigned to the, uh, to the third battalion as the, uh, first as a platoon leader, and then as a, the battalion S4 which was for the supply officer for the battalion. We, we were in New Guinea for about uh, uh, six months. And then uh, around Christmas of 44, uh, we, we started to, well, in fact, it was in December, we started to plan to move to the Philippines. And uh, our mission in the Philippines was to land at uh, Luzon and uh, the island of Luzon, which was north, where Manila itself was on Luzon. And we, we made a landing on January 9th uh, in, Ling, in Lingayen Gulf, which was uh, quite a bit north of Manila. And then we fought all around uh, uh, the, the area we made a landing on uh, the 9th of January at 45, and we landed in an area called San Fabian. And uh, the biggest problem we had on the landing was uh, there were so many uh, shell holes all over the area there that we had to watch out that we didn't fall into them. And, and uh, when I was in the second wave landing there and we get off the main transport, we went into the small boats, and then we circled around as, till it was our time to make the move in. And the only problem with that was we were circling around the USS battleship California. And as we came around, all nine guns were firing at, right over our head, and I, was, I, was, I couldn't hear anything for a couple of hours. <laughs> Finally landed on the beach and moved inland. And uh, uh, we, uh, the, the regiment uh, moved in and took a ridge, and that's where I shot my first chap. Uh, I was standing, uh, moving up this trail, and this, these two Japs jumped out of a foxhole. And uh, I had a, a, a carbine, a U.S. Uh, a carbine rifle, which uh, was not too powerful. And the, the guy that was next to me had an M1. The two Japs got up and they ran out of the hole and I shot one of them with my carbine and I could see the rounds, put about 10 rounds into his back before he finally went down and was dead. The other guy fired one shot and just as he was firing, the other Jap turned around and, and shot back at the other guy and he hit him, he hit him in the arm, but my companion there uh, ended up uh, killing the Jap. His round went and killed him. The Jap's round hit him in the arm and uh, he really had a bad wound here, which we get, I gave him first aid, but he, he survived the war. We, we, were in the, we were in the Philippines for about, uh, from January to, to uh, late August. And then uh, we, we were fighting uh, all through uh, Luzon. We were at. Uh, we took. Uh, we went through Clark Field, which was a big Air Force base. 
that the Japs were using and they evacuated it. Fort Stotzenberg, uh, we, uh, we, we were fighting in the hills on the road to Baguio, which was a Filipino uh, winter uh, or summer capital. And uh, we moved down uh, towards Ipo Dam and Wawa Dam and uh, we took both of those dams. And uh, then they, uh, they, they, uh, uh, I got, I got uh, hit, and uh, in April, um, I was evacuated off the Philippines to an island called Biak, and I stayed there for about a month and a half, and then I came back up to uh, the Philippines and joined the unit again. And by that time, I was made liaison officer at the regimental headquarters. And, uh, and then also at that time, we were pulled out of the line, the whole division, uh, because uh, everybody was anticipating uh, the landings in Japan on Kyushu. And uh, <coughs> we, of course, as you probably know, they dropped the A-bomb in August. And then the second one a few days later. And, and then around the 15th of August, the Japs gave up. And on the 2nd of September of 45, they, uh, uh, they uh, signed the peace treaty on the battleship Missouri. And uh, then we moved out and landed in uh, Japan at uh, Kumagaya. Uh, no, I'll take that back. Uh, we landed at uh, Yokosuka which was a, nav a naval base for the Japanese. And, and even when we got off the, the ship, we had to go into the, the harbor was so badly battered up and ships were sunk all over the harbor, we had to come in on small boats. So I thought we were gonna land at the dock, but again, we went over the side as we had done so many times. <laughs> and uh, we, we, uh, we got on a train in Yokosuka and uh, we, we went right through Tokyo, and I found uh, uh, that uh, Tokyo was probably 90% destroyed by fire bombs and other bombs. And the only area that wasn't hit was around the Imperial Palace and where the uh, official buildings for the government were located in a the, in the small, maybe a mile diameter, if it was even that much. But uh, as we went up, up, to, up uh, north of Tokyo, through Tokyo, uh, we went to the, the, the uh, airfield at uh, Kumagaya, which was about 60 miles north of, uh, of um, Tokyo. And I, it was interesting, as all the troops are on the train, you know. We, it, it was uh, an old, seemed like it was a train that would have been used in the States around the 1900s. They, they were clean, but they were old. And as we looked out the windows, as we went by the rice paddies going north, every, every person that was out in the field, the Japanese, uh, they turned towards the train and they all bowed down, you know, to the conquering American. <laughs> so we thought that was pretty good because that, that, that meant we weren't going to have a lot of problems with the, with the Japs. But there was some... Uh, uh, some of the uh, Air Force in Japan that uh, did continue to do uh, uh, go out on their kamikaze flights, to, and in fact, they were just committing suicide. And uh, but all the time I was there, two months, we never had an incident with any uh, Japanese person uh, or army guy, and uh, most of them were uh, uh, released from service. And up at Kumagaya, we had a we had a probably uh, 500 uh, Japanese uh, soldiers that did all the dirty work. We had no KP for our troops. They did they, they cleaned up everything. The, uh, they uh, kept the place clean, and uh, uh, we had no no problem. They did all all the all the work that had to be done around the post. So we had it pretty easy actually, and. Uh, well, we did take over the uh, equipment from uh, two Japanese divisions. One was an armored division, and uh, they were in this, located around the area of uh, Kumagaya, 
uh, town and the airfield in a radius of about 10 miles. And we took this equipment and then we let, when, once the equipment was all turned in, uh, the Japanese government uh, excused all these soldiers, there were millions of them, uh, from active duty and they were able to go home to wherever they came from in Japan. But uh, we, uh, I remember one incident, uh, I, we were, I was driving along with my sergeant in the Jeep and I, I went like this, you know, and I said, geez, my, I got a little bit of a beard. And, and just then we drove by a, a Japanese barber shop. And it, it reminded me of one in America because they had one of those poles, you know, with the red and, and white uh, pole there. And uh, I said to the sergeant, pull in there, I'm going to get a shave. So we, I go into the, to the uh, barber shop, you know, and there's two women barbers in there. And they got two chairs, you know, just like an American barber shop would have, you know, and, and they, uh, I, I made out, I couldn't speak Japanese, a few words, but not many, you know. And uh, I made the point that I wanted to get a shave, and she kept, the uh, barber kept saying, in, yeah, okay, in her language, okay, I guess. So I get laid out in the chair there, and uh, she whips up all these hot towels, you know, I got a beautiful shave. And uh, with a straight razor, and I'm lying there, and I'm saying to myself, "What if that woman thought I killed her husband, or sweetheart, or something? She'd run that across my neck." And the sergeant told me when I go, "You're nuts, lieutenant." <laughs> I was a first lieutenant too, which reminds me, the day that I landed on the 9th of January was the day I got promoted to first lieutenant, but I didn't know it for two months. Later on, the orders uh, got down to me, down at the battalion. But uh, we, uh, I had, uh, uh, the Army had a system of points. So the, the, the military folks, the Americans, that had uh, uh, the most points, the, the, uh, anybody that had 85 points or more uh, could go home from Japan. And anybody with less than 85 had to stay there as occupation troops. I had 140 points, so there was no question I was going home. So the, the idea of the point system was you had uh, one point for each, each month in the Army. I had over five years, almost six. You had got one, one point for every uh, month you were in combat. And I had 37 points right there. <laughs> then if you were married, uh, you got a, a five points for being married. And if you, I, we had no children then, so I didn't get anything for children. But I had, uh, I had several decorations, uh, Bronze Star medals for valor. In fact, I had three of them. So I got five, five points each for those. I totaled up, uh, I had 140 points. And so I was on the first ship to go home. And most of my good, close buddies were in the same boat as I was. So we all came, the, the ones that I knew well, a whole bunch of them got on the same ship. And we ended up, we ended up in uh, San Francisco har Harbor. We thought we were going to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. But en route from Japan, uh, they changed the orders of the ship and came into uh, San Francisco. And we got on a dock in Frisco and they put us on ferry boats and rowed us up to uh, Frisco Bay there to a, a Camp Stoneman, which is about 40 miles from uh, Frisco. And when we got there, uh, I, uh, I had nothing to do. You know, we were waiting to get on the train to go to back to Devons where we finally ended up. So some of my close buddies, two of them anyways, and myself, we went down to the finance officer and uh, they gave us a barracks, you know, the BOQ to live in. We were all officers. The captain and, and the two lieutenants, uh, that we, we went down and got a partial pay and went to Frisco 
and disappeared for three days. <laughs> and I got a picture home on my desk of the three of us at the top of the mark, feeling no pain, yeah. if you know what I mean. We were partying. And we, we got uh, tied up with two Navy guys and officers, and we hit every spot in uh, Frisco, I guess. And three days later, uh, four day, the fourth day, actually, we got back to Stoneman, and uh, uh, they never even missed us. So I really technically was AWOL, the only time in my Army career. <laughs> And then after, uh, after we got back to uh, Stoneman, we, got, uh, we were there turning in all the equipment we had, rifles, uh, packs, webbing, and all that sort of stuff, uh, watches, binoculars, uh, all, everything that we didn't have to take home with us. And uh, we got on a troop train. We were eight days and nights traveling from from Camp Stoneman to Fort Devens, where I was finally separated. And, uh, but I did join the uh, uh, Reserve Officers Corps. And, and so when I got back to the States, I, uh, I decided uh, you know, I'd take a month off or so, and, uh, which I did. And uh, then uh, they started the uh, 43rd Division up again in uh, 46. My separation date, by the way, was uh, 31 January 1946, and uh, I joined the I joined the guard again, and then I got uh, called up during the Korean War, and, and that at, uh, as soon as I during my what they call the terminal leave period after after we got back to the states. I was promoted to captain because my time and grade had come up and they automatically promoted me. And so I took over a company in the National Guard and uh, they, uh, I had that company for about five years in the Guard and then 1950 comes along and uh, the fall of 50 we got uh, called up in order to active duty again for two years. And so I took uh, my company down to Camp Pickett in Virginia. And uh, while we were there, we were supposed to go to Korea after a few months of training. And they changed our mission to become a training division. And uh, in my company, I had 200 people. And we were each, each company was levied with another uh, 140 men, which we put into three platoons. And we had to train them, for, and and that training uh, took 12 weeks, and then some of them went off to special training, and, and we didn't keep any of them. I had some National Guard troopers there that I would have been very happy to get rid of, but and I tried it, but I got shot down, and I, I had to get rid of all. And, and then we we got another levy and another one, and the third levy we were able to keep most of them that we wanted. And then we shipped out to Germany. And uh, in Germany, we were stationed in Bavaria. I uh, still had my company. And I, I, I really enjoyed having a company. That was probably some of the best duty I had. I had it for, uh, I was a company commander for about seven years. And uh, we were living in a, in a town called Bad Tols, which was, uh, in southern Bavaria, beautiful country in the foothills, about 400 foot elevation, and uh, we were the troops were living in what uh, we called uh, the Germans called caserns, and uh, they, the the caserne that we were in was called Flint Caserne in Bad Tols, was built in a big square building, three stories high. It had a. It was a previously had been the, the OCS for the SS troops and the officers in the German army, where they they got to be a lieutenant and then they went out on the various duties. The the the, the uh, concern had Olympic-sized swimming pool, Olympic-sized gym, 
a big soccer field, uh, all the maintenance facilities you'd ever want. The troops had a PX and a gas house right on, a well, gas house is a beer house, you know, beer hall. I'm sure you know what that is. And so the troops had everything right there, but there wasn't enough room for all the officers, so we were living in hotels in Bad Tolts, which was very nice too. But every morning, we had to get up and get uh, be at the concern at six o'clock to take Reveille for your command, and then you then you had to uh, uh, make sure some of the officers went with the troops to make sure they got fed and all that. And we'd go back to the hotel, have breakfast, and then we'd have to come back for duty. And uh, we uh, we were uh, after we got situated there. Uh, one uh, battalion reinforced of the uh, regiment was up on the Czech border for 10 days. One, one battalion reinforced was uh, at Grafenwur, which was where we did all our range firing. And the, Germ the Germans had developed that range. And then the other time for 10 days, you were at the Caserne. So you were constantly on the move. And then we went on maneuvers for 10 day periods. And usually, by the time we got there in Germany, it was the early part of October. About November, it started to snow up in the foothills there. <laughs> and we had snow on top of snow. It snowed almost every day. And uh, we also would get uh, uh, alerted at nighttime, usually two o'clock in the morning, we'd have to evacuate the concern, move out into an area. Each unit had a special uh, coordinate on the map where they had to move the, the company to. And then we'd have to, sometimes we'd stay for an hour, sometimes we'd stay for two days <laughs> in the field. So when we went out in the field from, on alert, we had to carry everything with us that we needed. And that, that got a little bit hairy sometimes. Uh, and it was cold there, and it snowed, and it snowed more. And uh, every uh, another thing we had to do, if you were in the concern, every Monday night you went out on a 10-mile march, full pack, full weapons, IMO, everything, and, and hiked for 10 miles, which made you stronger, I guess. <laughs> but one of the problems with the German roads, when when they plowed them, their plows weren't like the big trucks we had. They had smaller trucks, and they used wooden plows. And, and the roadway would get to be curved, like this, you know. So you're hiking up a road, and the next thing you know, you're falling on your butt. It's so slippery because the traffic had made the road icy, you know, and slippery. I remember the first hike we went on, my regimental commander, he was leading the pack there, he decided the road was too bad. So he just he gave a right a column and everybody moved off the road in column. And company by company, we were going through new snow, you know, about this deep. So it got to be pretty tough walking through that deep snow. So the first company, after it made a pass for a mile or so, they reverted to the reverse to the end of the column. And the next company would come up and beat the path through. But we still liked Germany. The beer was wonderful. The gas houses were fine. The food was great. And um, if I had a, a, I had a chance to go back to Europe uh, in the 90s, but uh, my wife is Lithuanian, and she wanted to go to Lithuania. So we went to Norway, Denmark, Norway, and uh, Lithuania. And uh, we spent about uh, 15 days over there. And she met all kinds of relatives from, from her family. It was a very enjoyable trip for her. And then I stayed, uh, after the tour in, uh, for the Korean War, I stayed active in the Guard and then went active again uh, and uh, went to various service schools, the Command and General Staff College, which is, this is a lamp of knowledge that I got, all that knowledge at, for a year at the uh, Command and General Staff College. I'd been to, I became a nuclear weapons officer. I served as um, 
Uh, just before I left Germany, I, I lost my company. I became the S4. And when I came back to the States, I was the S4 at, in, uh, and I, I was there in a full-time status. You wear the uniform all day, you know, active duty status. And uh, I uh, was an adjutant of the regiment uh, for a couple of years. And uh, they, uh, then uh, we had some reorganizations. I was a moved up in what we call the battle group. I served there as a executive officer to battle group and then deputy commander. And for a short period, uh, the commander of battle group, which is a unit of about 1,500 personnel. And uh, I went to army management school. I, uh, while I was on active duty down in Pickett, I went to the field grade officers course for uh, six months at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, during my uh, career, I think I've been to Benning about 10 times for refresher courses. I've been to Fort Leavenworth uh, three times for refresher courses for two weeks. And uh, then I um, was assigned uh, as uh, at the division. I was assigned as G2, Lieutenant Colonel, and uh, had that job for oh, almost a year, and then I became G3. Had that job for a year, and, and then I was moved up to be the state uh, uh, G3 officer and military operations and plans officer. And uh, I finally ended up my last six years as chief of staff for, for uh, two different major generals. And uh, I got promoted to be a full colonel and served as a full colonel for 12 years. And then decided it was time to retire. So at 56, I retired from the service in 1976. And became a, I worked for the state for a while in the gaming commission. And uh, then I uh, did some, uh, construction work. I bought a couple of houses and redid them. One of them I still have. It's a three apartment uh, rental in uh, in Avon, in uh, Unionville. And we have our home in Unionville. I have uh, three children and uh, have, uh, I have, I, I am a great grandfather twice. <laughs> I'm a grandfather six times, seven times rather. And uh, all my kids have turned out good. All my grandchildren have turned out well, all educated, uh, college. My, uh, my granddaughter, uh, Alicia, is a school teacher. She graduated from Assumption in Massachusetts. Uh, my, my grandson, uh, he graduated from Bard in New York. Uh, my uh, granddaughter, Catherine, graduated from St. Joseph's, she's a nurse. And uh, my two younger, two of my younger grandchildren, one is at uh, uh, college in Virginia, James Madison, she's in her second year. And my grandson, John James Higgins Jr., or the third, he's, uh, he's a senior in Avon High School, honor student, and he's, uh, he's gonna be an engineer, he says. Oh. Since you retired, have you joined any veteran organizations? Do what? Have you joined any veteran organizations? Yes, I belong to the VFW. Mm -hmm. I joined the VFW uh, in Newington uh, after the Korean War, and I, I stayed in that unit for a couple of years, but I didn't really enjoy the group there. They, uh, they seemed to be uh, too much partying for me. And, and then about five years ago, I joined the uh, VFW in Avon, uh, the 30, post 3272, which is outstanding post. We have about 150 members. We meet once a month. We do a lot of, uh, we give scholarships to uh, high school kids that are going off to college. Uh, we have a, we don't have our own facility, but we, 
uh, we uh, meet at a, an Italian club uh, on uh, Old Farms Road in uh, Avon. And uh, several of the people, by the way, in, that uh, were original members of that uh, uh, club, uh, Italian club there, were also in my regiment. And uh, two, two of them recently passed away. One of them was uh, uh, Ray Zachary, who, who uh, w was wounded badly uh, on the island of Banga in New Georgia. And he was in a wheelchair most of his life. And he just died here in August. The other guy was a, uh, in, in, uh, uh, his name was Fred uh, Rotondo, a longtime Avon family. Uh, he died uh, in uh, March. He was in M Company, and I was in uh, 3rd Battalion headquarters. And uh, Ray Zachary was in the 2nd Battalion. And I didn't know either one of them that I could remember. Though, you know, a battalion has about a thousand people in it, up and down you know, a little bit. And, uh, but they knew a lot of people that I did. <laughs> in fact, I went to the dentist uh, uh, here back about uh, six months ago, and, and the uh, dentist's helper there, or technician, was a Zach married to a Zachary, and she wanted to know I go visit another old buddy that's in the Brightview home there a couple times a week. And uh, when Fred Rotondo was in there, she wanted to know if I knew him. And then she said, did you know a guy named Charlie Alex? I said, Charlie Alex? Yeah, I know. He's one of my best friends. He's out of New Britain. He's, he put in 30 years uh, in the service. And he's still around, too. So... In the, in the VFW post, I find it quite interesting. Uh, the, 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 um, the, the people I've been friendly with, with you know, very close. We, some of us have gotten pretty close. Uh, one of them is a, was a, uh, on the staff of General Patton. And I kid him because I said, I bet you never, you don't know what a foxhole is. He says, what's a foxhole? He says, I don't know. He says, we always stayed in hotels and, and castles. <laughs> I said, you don't know what a foxhole? You ever get stuck in a foxhole when it rained? And he says, no, I was never out in the rain. He says, I don't think I even had a raincoat. <laughs> he was always at a major headquarters, you know, and with Patton. He, uh, he ended up the war as a captain like I did, too. And uh, another, another guy is, uh, he was a, a, an engineer uh, navigator on, on, in the Navy, in George England. I think you interviewed him, or somebody did anyway. Nice guy. And uh, all, the, all the people I, I've met at the post there are outstanding. Uh, some were enlisted, uh, so I always say I put three years in as an enlisted man from private to master sergeant. Well, they think that's pretty good. How the hell do you make master sergeant? I <laughs> said, being at the right place at the right time. But uh, they're, they're a very good bunch. And uh, we, uh, we also uh, uh, adopted a company from the National Guard that was over in Iraq. And we used to send them every month uh, all kinds of goodies, you know, that they wanted. And um, they're back now. For, they put their year plus in 18 months, I think, they were over there. So uh, most of them from the state, the Guard, are back in the state, but there are some more that are, are going. But we just, we just picked one company, and, and we're going to do that again now that the, that company is back. Your services and experiences affect your life? Well, I, I know they, both the service I had in the CC camps and in the Army initially uh, did affect my life. My father, though, had some effect there, too, because he, was in the, he spent 14 years in the Calvary, and he was down in the Mexican uh, uh, affair, were chasing Pancho Villa, he was in the cavalry, and he 
his uh, commander was Brigadier General um, Pershing, and uh, he was in one of the regiments that they, and, and he was in World War One also. But then when he met my mother, uh, he was stationed at Camp Grant uh, in uh, Illinois, I think it is, and uh, her brother was a sergeant, and my father was a lieutenant by that time, second lieutenant, and uh, he and he used to tell us stories, you know, of World War One, and a lot of them I took to heart, you know, and I always had an interest in this, and that's why I joined the CC camp, because I knew it was run on a military banner, and uh, when I got in the when I got into the uh, uh, army, I found I liked it. A lot of people, you know, they hated it, but I liked it, and then it affected my thinking for the rest of my life. To this day, I, I'm, I'm an army uh, supporter. You know. Uh, why? Did you the army? You why? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I'll tell you a story I never said before, but. Uh, uh, I uh, another, two other guys from high school. When we graduated, we talked about joining the Navy. Join the Navy and see the world. So we go down to New Haven, and we're going to join up after we graduated from high school. And uh, one of the guys went. Myself and the other Johnny uh, John, his name was too. We got turned down on the physical. I had two bad teeth, and the Navy said, all your teeth have to be first class, no problems. We don't want to be your dentist. You know? <laughs> they turned me down. So when I went to the CC camps, they grabbed me right away. They, they didn't care about your teeth. They, well, they checked them, you know. But uh, So I never did get in the Navy. I could have been in Pearl Harbor by that time, you know. But uh, in, in the end, I was glad that I got in the Army. I enjoyed the people that I knew and met in the Army and buddies uh, that uh, I could not see for 20 years and get together with them. It was like yesterday. We were in a foxhole together. You know? <laughs> or somebody was shooting at us. And uh, a lot of my friends got killed. Uh, but that that was war, you know. You, you couldn't expect not to have some people killed and wounded. So, but uh, I always liked it, and I uh, the army educated me. And uh, I, I when I uh, started my company up in uh, for the uh, after World War Two, I got twenty five of my friends from the area around uh, uh, Hartford to join my company. We had to start from scratch, you know. So I had 25 veterans came into my company and eventually we ended up with almost 200. That's, that's, uh, we had to do a lot of recruiting too, yeah. But, and, I, and I want you to know that um, when I first got into the, uh, uh, into, uh, the CC camps, my pay was thirty dollars a month, and uh, when when I went into the army, the National Guard, it was a dollar a day, and every three months we got twelve dollars. <laughs> so, yeah, I wasn't making big money then. And uh, when I got into the uh, later on, I got into the higher ranks. You know, like uh, uh, my wife and I got married uh, on the twentieth. In fact, the 20th of December, we'll be married 66 years. And um, about a month before, uh, maybe a month and a half before we got married, I got promoted to master sergeant. And that was a pretty big increase in pay. In fact, as a master sergeant, I got $1 a month more than a second lieutenant. And I didn't have the problems he had. <laughs> so. My my uh, my wife and I uh, I told her, you know I'm a rich master sergeant. We can get. But she came down with my mother right after the war, you know, and then uh, we decided we've been going together for almost four years before uh, the war. 
and in high school, you know, all that. And uh, we uh, asked her to marry me. And I said, you're going to marry a rich master sergeant. <laughs> so we managed to survive after we got married pretty well as a man. With the money I got as a sergeant plus the marriage allowance, it was very, very good. And uh, she never really liked the military. And, you know, I got moved around a lot. I've been in camps all over the United States, uh, not just uh, during World War II, but afterwards. Uh, Fort Benning many times, Leavenworth many times, uh, Fort Belvoir, uh, Pentagon, and sometimes she could move with me. And then uh, uh, when we were in during the Korean War, we had twin daughters, and uh, and then my son was born in the um, early 60s. So we, we managed to have a family, too. <laughs> but I liked the military. I liked the way they operated. I knew what the ins and outs were. and it, uh, I knew I could do well in the military. And I did. In fact, I turned down being a general in the uh, Army because I wanted to get out by that time. I had 36, almost 36 years in, and my wife's after me to get out, you know, and I did. Are there any other stories or experiences you'd like to tell us about? Well, I've been through uh, ambushes. I've been through uh, Badzai attacks. I remember the, in, the, in the Philippines, uh, I was the, uh, I had a command of a hundred uh, men and um, we were set up at the perimeter in, this, in the Philippines, not far from the main Manila Highway. And uh, we were off, of, just off a of gravel road. And we set, I set up a perimeter with all our weapons. And uh, I had a platoon, of, an anti-tank platoon was part of my command. and. The, and um, two o'clock one night, I'm in the foxhole. I got my telephones to some of the key spots, you know, on the perimeter. At, uh, we did in the foxhole with uh, a guy named Joe Valdez, who had just come back and joined us while we were in New Guinea. He'd gotten badly wounded in New Georgia. And um, we were in the foxhole. He was a, a first lieutenant. And I was too then, and I, but I was a commander. Two o'clock at night, it's, it's all peaceful, quiet. I'm wide awake, you know. And I check it on the phone, my what they call a sound power phone. Just check this machine gun position, the BAR position, the tank area, uh, anti-tank area. They had um, 47 millimeter uh, artillery pieces and a tank guns, and uh, all of a sudden there's two explosions. And in the center of the uh, perimeter we had a few trucks and a bunch of jeeps. And, and the Japs had slipped into the perimeter, two of them. They killed three of my men, bayoneted them, which I didn't know about till the next, next morning. And they put two magnetic mines on two jeeps. And when the mines went off, they ignited the gasoline in the two Jeeps. And the next thing I know, the machine gun, which was located in a position which was right in front of me, about 30 feet in front of me, is firing. And I see all this mass of Japs coming in through the entranceway. <laughs> so everybody's shooting at them, you know, and uh, including me. And I see this Jap, it turned out he was a lieutenant, and he's waving his uh, samurai sword. And uh, the machine gun opened up just before they, just as they started to run in. And, and they got off about 30, 40 rounds, and the, the Jap lieutenant took a burst right in the chest. And he, but he had his sword up in one hand and the grenade in his right, and he let it go. And it hit right in the foxhole where the machine gun position was. 
Well, we, we, uh, it turned out that the minute the lieutenant got not down, he was only wounded. Badly, though. Uh, the the uh, other Japs were coming through, and our, the rest of them were firing, and we killed about 20 of them. We found them there the next morning. And the five, there were five guys that were wounded, Japs, that crawled off out of the area and down across the gravel road in, in back of a, a, a where the, there was a drop off of about three feet. And the, the, when the lieutenant got down, went down, the rest of the Japs stopped running towards us and turned and ran off. And there were about 40 more of them that took off. And they, uh, they ran, they started across the field. Well, of course, our, mission, our orders were to stay in your foxhole and not get out. And so we stayed there till first light. But about a half hour after the Japs left us, I hear all this firing going on over on the Manila Highway, which is the main route between Manila and Baguio, a paved highway. I didn't know it, but L Company had a platoon on that road as a roadblock. And the Japs were using it at night, so they put a roadblock there. And the lieutenant was a guy I knew from L Company, we called him Tennessee. I can't remember his last name, but we he came from Tennessee. He said, I talked to him a couple of days later, and he said, I said, that's your platoon out there. Somebody told me you had a roadblock. He says, yeah. He says, I heard all these Japs coming. He says, they were laughing and jabbing away in Japanese. He said, and I had a whole platoon up on the, half on either side of the road. And he said, when he, when he got about 50 yards in front of him, he opened up with two machine guns and all BARs and all his weapons, half of a platoon, which is about 20 guys, and they killed them all. So that night, uh, while we were, it was quiet, we started hearing these uh, Japanese singing their uh, Shinto prayer, prayers, I guess they were. and. Pretty soon I hear a, a, a Jap grenade has to be tapped on the helmet and uh, then it ignites and then they throw it. But these guys, four of them, put the grenade on their chest and they kill themselves. So at first light, I take a squad with me and I call the guy in the anti-tank platoon and I say, you come around from the right, there's, there's still some Japs laying on front of us there and I'll come around from the left. So when I walked out, I stepped right over a saber, and the sergeant in back of me picked it up. <laughs> so I came around with him, and, and he, we didn't say anything about it. We were interested in seeing what the heck had happened. And uh, we get over there, and there's the lieutenant, and he's kind of half sitting up and half lying down. And in, in one hand, he's got a grenade, in the other hand, he's got a little knife, which I have home right now in my booty chest. <laughs> and so I, I uh, the, the guy from the, the lieutenant from the heavy weapons platoon, three of his men, and there were my men too, got bayoneted. And he was all upset about it, you know. He came around, it was his M1, and he saw the Jap lieutenant there. Just, be, just uh, uh, a few seconds after I got there, and I'm just trying to, I could see he picks up his rifle, you know, to shoot. And he empties the clip into the uh, M1 clip, which is eight rounds. Enter, and some of them hit the Jap in the, in the body, and he killed him. Anyways, I took the grenade out of the guy's hand, the Jap's hand, and I flung it away because it was a dud. And I took the knife, and I took his watch, and I took the papers out of his pocket, and some of them had bullet holes in them. And uh, the the watch that he had. It still got his blood in it to this day. I just keep it locked away. And uh, I, I took this, the guy's saber case off his belt, and I turned around and I gave it to my sergeant. <laughs> You'll need that to put the sword in it. It was a nice sword he got, too. I'd already had a sword, so I, I was kind of ticked off that I didn't see it. I said, 
better he got it. I already got mine, which I have in the home, too. I also got a Jap pistol from, from that lieutenant. But he got dead quick. And uh, that poor lieutenant, uh, after I turned in all the maps and overlays the lieutenant had in his jacket pockets, uh, the S2 came down to find out why, uh, how come the guy, uh, we don't see the guy, we didn't get a chance to interview him. I says, there's no chance he was, he, the lieutenant, he was almost dead. And he made him dead by put the, the better part of eight rounds in him. That guy had a lot of bullets in him. And he was still alive, even after he, the guy hit him a little bit, he was still, he died, you know, while I was right there. But uh, we got a lot of information from him on the maps and overlays that he had carried. But those other, that was one thing with the Japanese. If the leader got killed, they didn't seem to have any orders other than to die in position or move out. And that's what they did. They moved out and they got killed anyways. So that was a bonsai attack I went through. Another time, I had a, I, while I was there, I, I had lined up a Filipino who spoke pretty good English. We called him just Mac. His name was Mac, some, Mac or something. I can't think of the whole name. I made him a sergeant, and, and he gathered together 11 men, and I, I used them as uh, uh, patrol people. I gave them uniforms, weapons. I got approval from the battalion to do that. And they would come back and say, uh, we, uh, we killed a couple of Japs today. There were only two of them. They must have been out wandering around. And uh, after they came back two or three times and they killed a couple of Japs or they, and they'd give me some maps, you know, and stuff, I said to them one time, how do I know you, you killed them? He says, uh, oh, we, we shot them, uh, you know, they had our weapons, so they had plenty of weapons to do with. So uh, I, I said, uh, he said, if you don't, you come back and you tell me, you got to give me some more stuff, you know, to, to make sure they're dead. He came back the next time with the Jap's ears. Can you imagine that? <laughs> awful. But uh, one day he came by and he told me they had some Japs uh, holed up. And uh, they were about a half a mile from where we were. So I took a couple of squads and his squad that was already holding them there. And we went out there and uh, uh, I found out that the, they were in a position where there was the river, the Buhed River, which was a big river uh, in, in that area in the Philippines, had, when the, in the heavy uh, uh, rainy season, the, the river got very high and it would wash out places of the bank. And once there was a, a section of a bank in back of them, and then there was part of a lower bank in the front. So I, I, uh, we, I line up the troops there, you know, and we start uh, firing to hold them down. We got a little fire back. I took two of my sergeants and I gathered together some grenades. And each of them had ended up with six grenades. And I sent them around to the back. And they said, you're going to be my artillery. And so you get up in the back there, and you throw the grenades down in the ravine. So they did. And as soon as they, uh, the grenades went off, I counted them. Twelve of them went off. I said to them, the men, follow me, you know, the old infantry guy. And we charged in there, and they were all killed by the grenades, although some were also f from our fire. And there was one Jap alive, and he was in a foxhole. They had dug a hole for him, and his arm was, he had lost his arm right at the elbow. But he had had surgeon, a surgeon had done the work on his arm, and he was all bandaged up, but he got hit with a few pieces of shrapnel, too, from the grenades. But basically, it was okay. The Filipinos wanted to cut his throat. I had to pull my pistol out, hold it up like this, and I said, the first guy that, that hits this Jap, it's the only one we got alive. We want to see what the hell he knows, you know. He was only a private. I don't think he knew much, you know. But uh, anyways, 
I had to get my men to make a, st a stretcher for him and carry him back to the prisoner of war center <laughs> back in regiment. <laughs> but he did survive. But uh, we did kill 19 of the Japs there. So I have a few notches on my... Another time, I'm driving uh, on Manila Highway. This was, uh, this was in uh, late March, I think it was. I'm driving along. I'm, I got orders to report to the regimental CP. And uh, I got a sergeant uh, with me as a, my driver and a, a rifleman in the back of the Jeep. We're driving along along the highway. And in, in the Philippines, there are a lot of rice paddies. You know, and when they build a road, they try to build it up so the water from the rice paddies won't get on the road. And so we're, we're driving along, the, and we're sitting up on the highway about 10 or 12 feet above the rice paddies. And I look up forward there, you know, and, uh, and by the way, I had a machine gun on a pedestal mount on the, on the Jeep. I look up ahead, and I see about 250 Japs over on the right side of the road. He says, holy mackerel. I said to the driver, stop the Jeep. I, I, I'm, I'm in back of the machine gun, you know. So I stand up and I pull the boat back of the machine gun and I start firing. And I tell the two, the two guys, fire your rifles down in that back. And, and the Japs looked like they were all drunk on sake or something. And, and they were survivors of an artillery barrage, I guess. And they, were, they looked like they were falling around drunk. And I'm, I'm plunging fire right into them. I get off about 70 rounds in bursts. And I had the, the guy that, had, uh, the, that loaded the ammo box had put tracer ammunition in. Every f five or six rounds is a tracer round. And so I could see the rounds going right in there. You know, and and uh, it, I had a uh, malfunction about 70 rounds out and the machine gun stops. <laughs> so I take immediate action, try to pull the bolt back and do, but the bullet doesn't come out of the chamber. It, it turned out there was a bent bullet later, I found out. And uh, so I picked up my M1, and we fire, we must have fired about four or five clips, and then I says, discretion is the better part of valor to my men. I said, let's get the hell out of here. We knocked out a lot of Jeffs. I have no idea how many. But uh, they never came after us, although they shot at us. A few of them did. They were probably not as drunk as they were. I don't know if they were drunk. But it certainly looked like it, the way they were just falling around. Uh, you know, I said to them, I was drunk once, and that's what I did. <laughs> More than once. All right, well, thank you for everything you think for being here today. Thank you for listening to me, old soldier that I am. <laughs>